Hey, Patrick, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are All you? right. How's your day going for you? Uh, pretty good. How about you? Good. Doing pretty good. How the uh how the quiz go the other day? It went well. I got I got I I got a pretty good score. Good, good, good. Yeah. You know what the average was in your class or Uh no. I don't think she shares that information unless it's like a bigger assessment. Okay. Or unless it's like necessary, obviously. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, how did today go? Did you have class today? I did. We uh, really just continued. I, yeah, we really just continued working with inverse operations. Mm -hmm. And so we, we learned it yesterday. Did you look at some of the stuff I put into the bit paper? I'm looking over there right now. Are you on the bit paper side? Um, I put it in there and now I lost the link, which is I'm really good at that. So, <laughs> no, I'll probably put it in the chat box. Yeah, okay. But yeah, so I, I'm kind and of just, can share I, I feel your like, screen too. Sure, wait, why would I, huh? If you can share your screen with the bit paper so we can go take a look at it here together. Uh, yep. Sure. I, oh, here we go. Gotcha. Uh, two. All right, there we go. I haven't put anything from inverse operations yet, probably because I had it yesterday and I was working mm -hmm. on doing it. So, and there's not a lot with inverse operations. I think I just need help, like, uh, not necessarily help, but just need really practice with that one. So, yeah. And I just need extra practice because I, I, I have a quiz on Thursday with 5.5 .5 and 5.6, okay, which is 5 inverse. 5. Inverse. Uh, no, that's five point. Hold on one sec. I think I put it on page one. Yeah. Uh, so five point five is function operation. So like multiplying, dividing, adding, subtracting functions, mm -hmm. which is paired with uh their domains. Okay. And then five point six is inverse reflections and functions, and that is also with domains. But that's only in case of like you know even roots type situation. Okay. So, so do you have certain questions or just the concepts here? Oh, uh, I just, I think I need practice to solidify them because I'm a bit wavy on them right now. That's where I am with these two. Okay. So and then I also... Just oh, sorry, these two then, 5.5 5 and 5.6? For right now, yes. I do have a workshop next Tuesday and a text test on Thursday of next week. Okay, I see your note up That now. test is this entire chapter. All right, well, what's it about function notation that you're uncertain about? Um, in terms of function operations, oh, you mean function operations? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I need help with this one problem that I can't figure out how to do. It's uh, number one on the first page of the bit paper. Okay, I'm trying to read Can this. Can you just walk this? me through that? It's really confusing. So, like, if you want to ignore the work, that's also okay. I was just like brain. Sure, let's take a look over here. Now, just make sure I can read this right. This saying twenty-seven to the four or three. Yes, 27 to the 4 third. And down below, what's that saying? 81 to the 1 fifth times 81 to the 3 fifths. Okay. So in these kind of problems, this is what's known as properties of exponents. <clears throat> and you're going to use your properties of exponents in a lot of different ways to uh, do whatever you got to do to make things crank, make things simplify. Okay. Now, 
if you were to take something, if it was to have the exact same base, and if you're going to multiply it, you would add the exponents. Now, what right. you can do with these properties, you can go forwards and backwards if you need to. And sometimes that's what you want to do. If you want to simplify it, sometimes you want to go in this direction. And sometimes it might be better to take something which is added and break it apart so you can do a better simplification on it. Now, okay. down below, I spy. See, I'm not going to worry about the numerator at first. But down below, I spy 81. It's the same base. Yes. So I'm going to add the exponents. Whenever I add the exponents, I have a fifth plus three fifths. The denominators are the same. So I don't have to worry about that issue. So I'm going to have four fifths. Now, you have to ask yourself at this uh, junction, do you want this problem to be complicated or you want it to be easier? Easier. Probably easier, right? So in that case, here's my recommendation. You do have 81 to the 4 fifths. What you would probably want to do is first take the fifth root and then power it up to the fourth power. Now, if you, what do you mean? Oh, okay, got you, got you. No, I got you. Okay. All right. Now, if I take the fifth root of 81, what's going to happen there? Taking the fifth root of 81. Well, I know the fourth root of 81 is 3, but I don't think it has a fifth root, does it? Right, so you're going to have a little bit of a problem here in this particular case. Yeah, you'll end up with the decimal, I believe. So what you're really going to have is really something like this. Okay. Now, you could still take the fifth root of it. The only thing is, you have a nice proper fraction. There's not much you're going to be able to do here that's really going to help you out. Okay. So it just might be better just to say 3 raised to the power of 4 times 4, 16 over 5. Now, do you see where I got the 16 over 5? Yeah. Okay, how do I get that? You multiply the 4 and the 4. That's right, you're going to power up. And that's yeah. one of the properties of exponents. If you power up exponential, you multiply the exponents. Got you. Now, over here... I have 27. And once right. again, I probably want to simplify before I start multiplying because it makes things smaller. And usually you want to keep things smaller before you really exaggerate them, get them blown out of proportions. So that four thirds, you might want to think about it from this perspective. But 27, that's three cubed. And in this case, it really paid off. Because when I take it, I apply the property. Three times a third is one. And then I power up to the fourth power. And there it is. Mm -hmm. Now, the next thing is, we can keep pushing on, though. Here we have an exponential again, numerator, denominator. In, in this particular case, there's another property of exponents that states if you have exponentials with the same base and you're dividing them, take the difference of the exponents. Right. So here I would say 3, 4, minus 16 over 5. And then I don't worry about the exponent anymore. It's really a matter of, hey, can we add and subtract fractions? Get a common denominator of 5, 20, minus 16. Just 4 fifths, so 3 to the 4 fifths. And you can't do anything else with the 4 fifths. Uh, now, if it's like 6 fifths, you might be able to do something with that. I might want you to write in terms of uh, factoring out the 3 and raising it to the power of uh, 1 fifth. 
that might be something they want you to do, but other than that, you're pretty much done. I see. Now, look at the work that I did, and then look at the work that you did. Which one seems easier to you? The one you did. Why is that? Because you you simplified the bases, and you combined like bases, and you kept it as quick and easy as possible. Right. So what I'm following is kind of like guidelines of simplify as you go, which makes it a whole lot easier. I see. Okay. Now, on your screen, you might be able to get a better uh, viewpoint if you were to shrink the browser. Try the upper right-hand corner. You see those three dots? See if you can change the zoom feature. Uh, I'm on an iPad, so it's not the same as a computer. I don't even know how I got here, actually. This is one of the issues I've been facing, is how to zoom out of this. I was hoping you might have some insight on that. Try but... using your fingers, two fingers at once. I, I, I've been doing that. That is the one that's like not been working. I don't know why this happens. It's like I don't even do it. It just happens and it pisses me off so bad. Ah, uh, here we go. Like that worked, I guess. Okay. Yeah. That's much better. So just remember uh, simplify as you go. And what I saw at first was the denominators, they have the exact same base. And I want to just kind of put those together if I can, because it makes it easier to work with and not so complicated. And I didn't even worry about the numerator at first. No, I could have. It's really just a choice that I'm making. Either work the numerator first or work your denominator first, because uh, eventually you have to do work both sides of it, the numerator and the denominator. Just make a choice on how you want to proceed. I see. So, um, one sec. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So, can I try the other one that I had up and see if I can? Sure thing. See if I. Where, where, where'd you put those problems? I think. Let me see if we can drag it over here. Okay. Yeah. This is. All right. So, it's. Root 6 of 81 over 4. So you do um, root 6 of 3 to the 4th, right? Because okay. that's you simplifying the base. Mm -hmm. Then you do root 6 of 2 squared. So now you rationalize the denominator, I think. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, so then you would do, you would multiply both sides by root 6 of 2 to the 4th, which would equal to, um, so 81 times 16, basically. Okay, tell me why you're doing it like this. I'm trying to rationalize a denominator. Okay, so why are you saying 2 to the 4th? Because if What's you your... multiply... Go ahead. So this, is this step, the circled in yellow, is supposed to be over here. I'm just trying not to move in like you know this direction because there's stuff over there. But um, if I multiply two, root 6 of 2 to the 4th by root 6 of 2 to the 2, I would get root 6 of um, 2 to the 6th, which is then just 2. So then I've rationalized denominator, and then now I can just work with the numerator. That's kind of where my process is. Right, because 2 plus 3 is going to be value of 6. <clears throat> now, are what? they teaching you to only work with radicals, or are they teaching you also to work with exponentials? No, they're doing that. They, they tell us we can do that as well. Okay. They taught now, us how to do that. In mathematics, we don't really work with radicals that much. We, we, we do have them, 
but oftentimes you can unlock certain aspects of the problem if you were to express it in exponential notation. Now, I'm just going to take this problem. I'm just going to, you're, you're doing okay. There's something wrong with what you're doing. I'm just going to show you a little different direction here. Oh, I see. So if you did 2 6 and 4 6, you could simplify it to 2 3rd and 1 3rd. Mm -hmm. Which is you can the, uh... definitely do that. Also, note that you can take the 81 over 4 and you can express that as 9 over 2. That's your going to square. And then 2 times the 6 is going to be a third. Uh huh. See how I keep using smaller numbers? Yeah. And then you can write the cube root if you like. Down below, I'll keep it like this. And you're really going to ask yourself, what do you need to multiply this by so that one third plus something gets you one? And you would say, of course, two thirds. Two -thirds. So when you pull it all together, you're going to have so nine. Three, nine to the one third times two to the two thirds, which would be 18 to the first. Okay. Let's see if that makes sense to their particular. So you have um, root 3 of 9 times, I'm just doing it this way because you wrote one and the other and I can't mm -hmm. like... Go right ahead. Yeah. Root 3 of 2 squared, which is 4 times 9, 36, and then you have the root three so okay and then you rationalize the denominator at the bottom so you have two i see yep good okay now when you work on this problem earlier what was the the main issue you're experiencing i think i didn't see the fact that you could simplify it um by turning it into rational exponents and that's where i like got carried away with the big numbers i think that's really what happened gotcha and I made a mistake somewhere because I was using big numbers. Yeah, it's easier to make mistakes with big numbers, isn't it? Yeah. So eventually, you're still going to simplify in the very end if you have big numbers or if you had small numbers and you make them a little bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now, let me throw you a problem here. And are you only working with numbers or else working with variables? Uh, well, how about you give me the problem and I'll tell you if we're doing that. <laughs> sure. Give me a second. Because it's hard for me to... I'll show you this one. Can you simplify it? P third to the one fourth and P five fourths to the second. Mm-hmm. So, um, P to the three fourths mm -hmm. over P to the ten fourths, and then three fourths minus ten fourths equals. P to the um. Negative seven, oh, three minus ten. Yeah, yeah, negative seven fourths. But then you have Drop. that, so it becomes positive. Good. And then, um, is that it? That's it. That's it. Okay. Just kind of a quick follow up question. You know, you could have also said five over two. But why is that going to be kind of a problem if you do that here in this case? 
five over two. Because ten over I, four. I, oh, same as five well, over two. then you have to like you have to sub subtract the fraction, so it makes it harder for you to do that. Right, you have to go back and eventually do it again, anyways. Yeah, correct. Okay, so let me throw you a whole bunch of problems. You ready for them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, 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 okay. Now, take a quick look at these problems and see if there's something that resonates with you or something you're not for sure about. So, I don't think so. Everything seems pretty okay on the outside. Okay, so let me pick but one. Try 81. Uh, How can you simplify that one? Okay. Give me one second. All right. Um, so is that one fourth or seven one seventy? I can't. That's negative one fourth. All right. Cool. So p to the two fourths um, times q to the third. I think six. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then three to the second p to the fourth q to the fourth third okay so then um that's nine p to the two fourth minus p to the fourth is one half minus four which is essentially one half, uh, or, yeah, so that'll be negative seven halves. So that's p to the negative seven halves, and then q, three minus four third, so nine third minus four, so five third, so q to five third, so nine p to the seven halves over q to the five third okay yeah you didn't make the mistake that a lot of people make some people will forget about powering up the three to the minus one it, they get so fixated on the constants so the variables that they forget about the three in front okay well, that's good that's good okay let me throw you these two or three what if you had a mixed match of different radicals? How do you can press it all down to a single expression? Uh, over time, I've just found that when I do that, I turn it into rational exponents, and I find <laughs> a common denominator and turn it back. <laughs> I need to. That's exactly what you want to do. Perfect. So just kind of go through the first one real fast. You have x to the uh, 3 fifths, x to the 1 fourth, same base, add the exponents. Get a common denominator, maybe 20. And that's exactly what you want to do here. So, yeah. X to 17, 20. But, but our teacher does say that when you... if So her rule is whatever form you start out with, that's the form your answer has to be in. So oh. she would want it like root 20 X to the 17th. Okay. Yeah, just make sure you give her whatever she wants, uh, dealer's choice. Yeah. but So I had a question about that, actually. So when you have um, so when you have x to the 17, 20, it's right in rational exponents form. So I just want to confirm the two ways to write this in radical form. One is x to the 17 root 20, and the other one is root 20 of x to the 17th, right? Are those yeah, the two ways? 
You can do it like that. Let me, let me show you okay. why. Um, if you were to look at your x to the power of n index of m, this is the exact same thing as saying x to the power of nm, right? Well, properties of exponents, what you could say from here is you can say this. You can also say this. Because what you have to do here is take the n times the 1 over m, and that is how you can say n over m. Or likewise, the other way. So you do have your, your different options you can go here. That's really your choice. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. All right. You ready for uh, the lightning round? Um, sure. How fast can you go here? See if you can simplify the expressions. A radical within a radical. It's kind of a radical idea. Amazing. All right. So it's x to the, yeah. So and that's one. So x to the half 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 half. So that's x to the one sixteenth. Mm -hmm. so I can move over my thing. Okay. Good. Now, I'm going to throw you one more problem here. Now, Patrick, one of the things in mathematics, math's not really necessary about learning how to do calculations. Now, we do calculations because it's trying to help us to understand things. In kind of at this level, you are learning how to do calculations, but underneath the scene, what we're trying to do in mathematics is we're trying to understand how things work. We're, we're, we're trying to find patterns. We're trying to decipher them. You can really think of math as like the patterns of science of pattern recognition. <clears throat> Go back to these three problems. What could you do to speed it up so you get the answer a little bit faster? I'm going to go back to this one and see if I can do it here. I would actually, now that I think about it, write in like two, two, and two in here so I don't forget. Mm -hmm. And then do x to the 2 times 3, which is 6 times 5, which is 30 times 7, which is 210 times 2, which is 420 times 4, which is 1640, which is times 2, which is... That's a lot, actually. I'm not going to lie. Is there an easier <laughs> way to do this? I mean, that's like a really big number. 3280, I think. I'm not sure. I might be wrong. You're getting it. That's exactly it. Okay. So what you could do here in this particular case, take all the indices... I mean, what's a 1 over 3280? So, if it's 3280, I'm not sure. Okay. I, a little bit off, but, you know, get the idea. Yeah. It's not 3360, but you got it. So, <clears throat> I can use this right here. By, by knowing how this works, we got to a lot faster, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Okay, look at the fourth one back here. How fast can you go again? So that be oh hold on. Why did the thirtieth? <laughs> you got it. And okay. that was less than what, ten seconds? Probably less yeah. than five seconds there. All right. Makes sense. Now 
here's a follow-up question, kind of a good concept question for you. If I looked at a squared plus b squared, and if I take the square root, here's my question. Why is this not a plus b in general? Well, I mean, it wouldn't be that because you're taking the root of a squared plus b squared. Like, I think you're taking it as like this. So it's that whole thing rooted. So then it ends up being this. And then you would have that equal. Right? No, it's not right. <clears throat> why is it why is it we can take the square off sometimes? Look at that sign. Oh. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So here's the problem. <clears throat> Whenever you're taking the square of a square, uh -huh. if you had things such as multiplication, in if I'm really talking about non-negative values, yeah, they'll, they'll pop it right off, not a problem. The thing is, <clears throat> because I do have the addition, things change up. You know, if this was true, and let's say if you were to square both sides, that would then say, if you take a plus b and you square it, all you're mm -hmm. going to square the terms, and that's not the case. Oh, I see. That's not the true. case, yeah. Yeah. Because you would do a plus, yeah, correct. You're missing a piece in the middle. <clears throat> so this right here, this would be a good question to put on a, like an honors exam. Explain why, or talk about why this is not the case. Because this is a real common problem that people have in a in a algebra two class in general. I see. Okay. So a good explanation would be something like this: a plus b quantity squared is not just a squared plus b squared, but it's also that piece in the middle. Gotcha. Do you think we could um, shift our focus to inverse operations for a bit? Let's do it. All right. What's an inverse operator? What's the inverse function? Uh, from what I was taught, it's when you flip the x and the y and you isolate the y, therefore getting a, the function of the original function flipped over y equals x. <clears throat> Okay. Do you understand exactly what's going on there, though? So, um, if can you have a graph paper on here? Is that like a thing? Uh, let's see. You can probably put that one up here. Oh, I found it here. Here we go. Okay. So, um, if we have, this is very crude, by the way, I'm not trying to like, there we go. Yeah, perfect. So if we have that, then we have the arrows. And so let's say this is parabola y, um, y equals x squared. Then you reflect that, oh, that's a horrible, okay. You reflect that over this y equals x then you end up getting something like this i think which is basically like it flipped over that line which makes this an inverse of that okay now let's pause that stop for I... a second i'm gonna jump down here in let me ask you a few basic questions. <clears throat> okay. When I'm looking at functions, what's a function first off? 
It's where are you? I don't really see you. Right here. I'm gonna pull this up here for a second. Can you see me writing? Yep, got you. Okay. okay. Cool. So what's um, a function? A function is basically I think put simply like if I'm if I'm talking about in terms of like table of values, every input has only one output and it's a graph of that. Or like a... Okay. So, so is a parabola a function? Sure. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Sorry. Is a square yes. root a function? Uh, forgot how that would look. Looks like a three pointer, like your shooting three pointer free throw yep. or something. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yes, it is. Is the circle a function? No. Why? Because oh, sorry. Because um, x's are inputs and y's are outputs. So if this is an input, because that's an x, then y has an output here and here, which is two. Perfect. And one way of how you can determine if it's a function, you use something called the vertical line, line test. Yeah. Right. What's the vertical line test? What's that say again? It's it's basically if if the vertical line is um, if the function passes through the vertical line at two separate points, then it is not a function. Right. So if you can find an instance which it crosses more than once, we're going to have an issue. Yes. Now, what about with inverse functions? If I give you the function f of x two x plus one, well. If I want to invert it, what does that mean when I say when I invert something? You flip the x and the y? No, I don't worry about flipping x and y. What does that mean if you want to say, just talking to your friend, you want to invert something? It's like Reverse you want to go back to where you started. Yeah. So if you want to invert it, find the inverse, go back to where you had for original values. So if you were to have your function uh, f of x equals your 2x plus 1, and let's say for a second, oops, let's go back over here. Let's just say if I had an output, which is 3, could you find the input? Well, yeah, sure. Solve for x, right? Yeah. And what if you had an output which was five? Could you find x? Two. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, that's going to allow me to invert it. I can go back to where it started. Yep. So you give me the outputs, I can find the inputs. Let's look at the function x squared. Let's say if I have a value of four for x squared. What was my input? It could be either 2 or negative 2. Perfect. So if it's 2 or negative 2, is it a function? So plus or minus 2. So then in that case. But wait a second. We said if we're talking about inverse functions, inverse functions are functions in by themselves. And if I had an input value that got split up, is that a, a function then? No, because an input can only have one output. So this does not have an inverse. It's not invertible. And that's where domain restrictions come in? Domain restrictions do play a factor here. <clears throat> now, when we're talking about graphs, mappings, relationships, they're functions they pass the vertical line test. So how do I know if it's going to pass the or being a invertible function? Say that one more time. How do I know if a function is going to be invertible? How do I know if a function is going to be invertible if it passes the horizontal? No, 
If it passes the horizontal, horizontal line, line test. test. That's exactly yeah. right. Okay. So if it crosses more than once, it's not invertible. And that's where restrictions do have to come in, into play. So if I restrict this and only look at, let's say, non-negative values, then if I was going to take this, and you're absolutely right, look at the graph y equals x, and you flip it along that axis. If you flip it along this axis, look at the graph you're going to get. Yes. Now, when you're work, working with inverse functions, there's a certain notation which is used. Remember this right here? F to the minus one. Yes, that's inverse notation, right? I don't know where you are, but I know what that is. <clears throat> Let me see if we can try to pull you down here. Can you see that? I see x is greater than zero. That's all I see. Oh, no. Let's see. Well, I mean, next to the graphs, obviously. Can you see me right on the screen still? Let mm -hmm. me see if I can reset it. <clears throat> but you have your f to the minus 1, and that's going to correspond to your inverse. Does yes, that have anything perfect. to do with exponents? No, I think that's just a way to say that this is the inverse. Right. So <clears throat> let me give you this. Let's say if I have two functions, f of x, 2x plus 1, g of x, let's say it's going to be x minus 1 over 2. How would okay. I know if these two are going to be inverses without graphing it? Um, according to what I have learned, you use, where is the word for it? Something called com compositions? Function? Com yeah, compositions, yes. Function compositions. Exactly. Yeah. So, so if you compose it, what should be your outcome? X. That's exactly right. Now, I don't know why, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I just like, I'm literally like, omitting to you what I've been taken, but I don't know why. What's the like the logic behind that? Right. Sure. Now, first off, let me see. Can you do the function composition here? So it would be... Okay, so it's the inverse of the function. Or no, this one wouldn't be that. No, no, no. It would be the... um. So it will be um, two times right, and then so it's two x minus two divided by two equals x minus one. Uh -huh. Um. Oh no! Jesus Christ! Mm, the inner piece. Did disconnect on you? Didn't disconnect, did the thing where it zoomed in, so I have to oh. reload it because I have no other way to fix it. Okay, so then you have x equals, uh, you, you just get x, you get x, right? That's what that means. That's exactly it. Okay, so, and so for this one, oh, mm -hmm. you, sorry, go ahead. If you do a function composition, you can say f in g or g with f, and it doesn't really matter for your case, which really is going to happen because it's going to be the same thing for your particular class. If you get x, that would then indicate that g is the inverse function. It would also say that f is the inverse for g. That's how that works. Now, let's take it back a step. If I have a function f, and let's say this is its domain, and I got my function with its range. If I take an input value, and if I was to transform it, contort it, bend it, twist it, add to it, whatever, I map it to some particular value, which we say is going to be in the range. 
Once again, we click the x squared graph. I take a value of two and I twist it, I bend it, I contort it, call it four. I take three, I bend it, it becomes nine. I get these output values. But if I'm talking about it inverse, remember, I want to go back to where I started. So it's like if I tie my shoe, I'm going to untie my shoe. Mm -hmm. I go back to over here. But notice what that's, what that's kind of saying here, Patrick. I take an input value, I make it into something new called Y. But I'm coming from all the Ys, going back into axis. So that says when I operate, I'm back to here. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take this and simply operate on both sides, look what you get. Let's see. F of y is y, but g of y is x. Okay. And this right here also highlights the fact of why you switch x's and y's to find the inverse function. Because when you look at your domain, your domain for f, that's exactly the same as your range. Or the inverse. Okay. Now that's a fact that's pretty obvious when you really think about it, but it has deep ramifications behind it. The domain for the original function is the range for the um. Oh yeah. For the inverse. Right. I see that now. Okay. And so the range... Okay, I got you. Yep. So, um... I have a couple problems on my sheet here. Is it okay if I do them with you? Yeah. Let's trim up here take a look at them. All right. I'll just write them down because I'm not, like, technically adept to, like, screenshot them or whatever. All right. So we have f of x. It's saying verify that f of x and g of x are in this function using composition, right? That's mm -hmm. a problem. Okay. So f of x is... Uh, 3x plus 5, g of x is um, a third of x minus 5 thirds. So now we, so can you explain to me why it's important that, so my teacher said when we're uh, doing function compositions, we use both to show her. And why is that important? Why is it important to show both? Yes. Well, uh, because that's that's really what the definition states. Later on, uh, there's something called the left inverse and a right inverse. But that's much, much, much later on. You're not going to even talk about that in high school. Uh, uh, unless it's like a real advanced like class at the senior level, you might do that. Um. But that's really what the definition states. And if you want to make sure you satisfy the definition, you want to make sure you satisfy every component of the definition. That's why they really want you to do F with G and G with F. And if you can show that they're the same and they equal X, you found the inverse. That's Got like you. saying, it's like saying if you do only one part, it's like you're getting one side of the story, you're not getting the full side of the story just for verification purposes. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Um, is it okay if I erase that? So I... Yep, you go right ahead. Yeah. All right. So also, uh, where can I find these sessions recorded again? I'll send you a link.
So I just have to ask for them? Is that what that, how that works? No, no. I'll, I'll get a link ready for you so you can always have them available. Is that ready yet? I, I don't have the link ready quite yet. Uh, we'll get it after this first session here. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so you would do f of f inverse of x, which is 3 times a third of x minus 5 thirds mm -hmm. plus 5 equals, that would be distributive, right? It would be. It's true. The 3. Good. Yeah, so x minus 5 plus 5, so equals x. So that works. And then you have f inverse of f of x equals um, third times 3x plus 5 um, minus 5 thirds. That does uh, x plus 5 thirds minus 5 thirds, which equals x, so that works. So therefore, f and f1 are inverses. Oh, but you would say, oh, no, no, you can't say that. Hold on. You have to say g. Right? Uh, yeah, I've started off with g. <clears throat> and yeah. technically, you do you want to say up here, because you're not sure quite yet, you would want to call it g. Oh, so that's true. Just be look careful about that when you submit your work, because they're probably going to be looking for that. So that'd be G, mm -hmm. and then even up here, oops. So even up here, um, it would be G right there, I think. Cool. All right. <laughs> and Good. The, yeah. All right, all right, all right. All right, go ahead and throw another one up here. Let's take a look at it. Maybe something a bit more, like an, over a different variety, I guess. Maybe something simple. I want to try one on the first page, or like the front, where it's like, uh, the question is, can you see where I am? I uh, yes, I can. Okay. Find the inverse of the functions below, write your answer using function notation. So, I guess my question is, so, oh my god, 5 of x equals, no, f of x, sorry equals root of x minus 3, right? So I have to find the inverse of that. So I would do x equals y minus 3, right? Then square both sides. So the inverse of x equals x squared plus 3. Kind of. So, Don't worry about your restrictions. I need a domain. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. going to say. So how would I, is it, so it's because we started off with the positive version, so we end with positive, so it's got to be x is greater than x. Well, you're kind of overthinking it. Remember, the domain for f is the range for the inverse, and vice versa. OK. So go back to the original function, find your domain, and find your range. Well, your range would be anything that's non-negative, so 0 to positive infinity. Your domain is anything that makes the radicand not negative. Good. 
So domain is uh, anything that makes the radicand not negative. Right. So, so take three the minus radicand three. Take it out. So negative zero minus three makes a negative. Two makes a negative. Oh, so it would have to be. Um, why is my pen not penning? All right, here we go. Three. That's right. And this is for the function f. So if you want to find the range and the domain for the inverse, how fast can you do it? Really fast, because you just got to copy. And then you can just copy do paste. this. Yeah. And then you have um, this, which is where this comes from. That's exactly it. See how okay. that was a little bit faster and easier doing it like this? OK. You didn't really have to sit down and really think about, is it this, is it that, what's going on? You know the relationship that the range of the function is the domain. Mm -hmm. Got Gotcha. All right. <laughs> Good. Um, do you have a couple of harder practice problems for me with inverses? Give me a moment. I sure do. Okay. And I think the really what I need to focus on right now in terms of inverses is like the domain restrictions is where I'm tripping up. Okay, what about this function? Can you identify its domain and range to begin with? I don't know. So what values can you not plug in that's going to cause an issue? Well, I know in the denominator it can be five twos. So x can't be five twos. That's it. As long as you see a clear of that, that five halves, you're in good shape. So that's your domain. That's it? That's it. Just make sure you don't divide by zero. And what about range? Now, are you familiar with how to actually graph your rational functions? Like, give me an example of a function. I'll tell you if I would know. Well, this is a rational function. Can you do you know how to graph it or? Oh, uh, I don't. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. <clears throat> okay, let me just show you what the graph looks like then. See oh wait, get... are they piecewise? Yeah, yeah. Oh no, not piecewise, but yeah. You have a vertical class. Oh yeah, yeah. Though. We haven't done this yet. We haven't done this yet. I've heard of it, but we haven't done this yet. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> what that would kind of indicate here in this case for this given one. If you take the ratio of the leading terms, you get negative one. So everything is going to work out pretty good, except for when you get to that negative one. That's going to but be. But I thought it was five function. twos. Well, that's for your domain. Oh. Uh, range is the y values. So negative one is not okay as a y value. That's where you're going to have a horizontal asymptote because negative two over two. You take the leading coefficients. It's negative one. So you take the leading coefficients and divide it to get the range. Uh, they'll get you the horizontal asymptote. And in this particular case, you're not going to cross a horizontal. So that means you're never going to get to that particular value. So it just going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but it'll never hit the one. That's right. It's going to get close to negative one on both sides, but it'll never actually get there. It'll keep going forever? It would. It would. That's really cool. <laughs> it's, well, hang on. You're going to see some really cool things here eventually. But anyways, here is your domain for your inverse. Now, we don't know what the domain or the inverse function is, but I do know what the domain is to begin with, because it's the range of the function. Got you. Okay. Now, see if you can actually find the inverse function. 
so we would do x is equal to negative 2y over 1. Sorry, 2 by 1 plus 1. 2y minus 5. So 2yx minus 5x equals, right? And then 2yx, we want to get the y values on one side. So 5x plus 1. And if I remember correctly, factor out the y. You can also factor out the 2, right? I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. So we would do 2y, my bad. X plus 1 equals 5x plus 4. So then you have 2y equals 5x plus 1 over x plus 1. And then you would divide by 2, so multiply by 1 half. So that will give you y equals 5x plus 1 over 2x plus 2. Right. Now you can also keep the 2 factored out if you want. But what's the one thing you can't plug into this function without dividing by 0? If you plugged in negative 1 for x, right? I don't understand. Oh, yeah. But yeah. she, okay, yeah, I, okay, yes. But I remember talking about this. She said um, those restrictions are not necessary to be included in the answer because they're not inverse restrictions. Look what we said earlier. Your domain for your inverse function is everything except for what do we say? Oh. Negative one. It's magical. <laughs> it sure seems like it, doesn't it? Yeah. So what you want to write in your notes is your your domain for your function is the range for the inverse, and the range for the inverse of the function is your domain for the fun for the inverse. So wow, I actually um so domain of f equals range of inverse right that's supposed to be a negative one and then range of f is equal to domain of that's exactly right so <clears throat> by knowing what the range is man you got your domain for your inverse that fast and uh i know oh we only have one minute never mind okay no All go right. ahead that's... go ahead I was just wondering if you had a problem where I had to like use the vertex to find the domain. Maybe something like the that. vertex. Yeah, because I we have some problems like that, and I need maybe a practice problem on that perhaps. I know we're out of time, but let me throw you this problem here. How about that one? Okay, so now I have to find the um, vertex. So I know the x is going to be um, negative 4 over 2, which is negative 2. And then you plug in that. So negative 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 8, negative 4 plus 7, which is 3. Did I do that wrong? Hold on. Uh, negative 2, 4, minus 8, negative 4, plus 7, 3. Okay, cool. So 3, so that's our vertex, right? Mm -hmm. And then we find the inverse, um, which is... Now, you can't find the inverse, because I didn't give you a restriction. So I have to find the domain and range. The problem is, is it an inverbal function? It's not. It fills the horizontal. Oh, because time. so. So let me we give need a restriction now. Let's say that oh. it's only valid for this side. 
Oh, so I see. Right here is invalid. So it's not there. It's not invertible because if, as we said before, if we inverted it, it wouldn't be a function because it wouldn't pass the vertical line test. All right. So if it passes horizontal, it's not an invertible function. <clears throat> but if I say things such as now, suppose that x is going to be greater than or equal to negative 2. Now you can find the inverse because now you're going to restrict it. You're, going to go, you're not going to consider anything less than negative 2. Only things which are equal to negative 2 are bigger. Are going to be part of the inverse. Which changes the original function to begin with. So your domain is not everything, is it? No, our my so my domain is, uh, yeah, yes, that's my domain. In your range, well, it's still it, going to be from three to positive infinity. Yes. So this is your domain for the inverse, and this is the range for the inverse. Then, that's how those things switch. And then basically you would complete the square, put in vertex form, solve for your variable. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I think that's all for today. I know we went over time. Not a problem. Glad I was able to help you out that last problem right there. You said yeah. your quiz is tomorrow or? Day after. Day after. <clears throat> okay. Well, best luck on it. Let me know how it goes, and I'll send you the link to this video here as soon as I can. Thank you so much. All right. All right. You take care. You too. Bye. I hope that today's lesson was a positive and an encouraging learning experience, and that you have a better understanding of how to solve these problems. Be sure to set some time there today and throughout the week to review these concepts, to rework these examples so that you're better prepared for the next lesson. If you need anything, just let me know. You're always welcome to send me an email or to stop by during office hours. Until next time, keep up the good work and have a great day.